the music that we love, which we consider it doo-wop or street corner. But it's more important than that. It is a labor of love. And this is the young man at a very early age who was fortunate enough to get a recording contract. And from the moment he sang, and I'm not talking about when they were called Little Anthony and the Imperials. I'm going to talk way before that. Let's have a big hand for Anthony Bernardino, ladies and gentlemen. A good thing we did earlier today, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, man, that was that was interesting. Did you people see that? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's so interesting to note that not only has music changed, but radio has changed, show business has changed. Yep. And the only thing that remains the same, you guys, you and me, we don't change. <laughs> it's the music that keeps us what we were doing. I said to them earlier, Anthony. Before Little Anthony and the Imperials, he was singing with two groups. <laughs> now, if you're going to play trivia, can you tell me the two groups he sang with? Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody. I'll tell you what. We'll give them a hint. Okay. Uh, big hint. <laughs> Trying to do. You know it? How you about know the label? How what, about what was the label? DuPont. They were called. The DuPonts. Actually, DuPonts <laughs> really wasn't the Imperials. They were before, before we got there. The, you the, were singing with them. Yeah, the, then, I, then I got with Clarence and Ernest, who's on the ship right now, and uh, they were called the Chesters. Absolutely. Well, fire the, burns no more. Fires burn no more. I wrote that, thank you. I'm getting no royalties, but that, hey. Let, let, let me tell you, <laughs> that song that he's talking about, you got, I have it in one of my cruising sounds. Do, do a little bit so they get an idea. When was that? 19, when you did it in 1956 yeah. it was. The fires burn no more. The fires burn no, no more. more. Gosh, man, I was a kid. I was a really, I got, my voice was real high then. You look good, though. I feel good, except the back, and we'll get yeah. that fixed pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> I used to walk around my, my, my um, back brace. Everybody knows about backs. You have your good days, and you have your bad days. The day was not so good. So I put the back brace on, and it looks like you're out from out of space somewhere, man. It's like really huge. <laughs> and I went, out, I came back on the ship, man. That thing blew off everything. I didn't even take it off. And the guy says, "Hey, you can't, what?" And they put the thing on me. I said, "No, no. Let me just take this off. It's this, right. man." Right. And he says, "What's that?" I said, "It's a back brace, and it's very cumbersome but very effective. You know, when you need it, it does help a lot." Let me ask you this: How old? <laughs> how old when you were singing with? The DuPonts and the Chesters? The DuPonts, I had just got the boys' high school in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So we started well, 1955. Mm -hmm. It was my second year in the high school. 14 years old. Sophomore, sophomore year. 14. I was four, yeah. Yeah, 14. Yeah, and so we hooked up with a lot of guys. Now, the, with the school that I went to in mm -hmm. Brooklyn had some of the most famous people in the world. It became famous, Richie Havens. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, um, what, what's uh, uh, the great basketball player? My mind went blank. You know how that is when you get this age sometimes. <laughs> Connie Hawkins, Tommy Davis of the Dodgers. Tommy used to sing in the group with us. You know, he then he made real money. <laughs> so, <laughs> you then segue into meeting a fella who's <coughs> legendary. This man by the name of George Gonder. Oh, yes. Was a fellow that came from the world of Latin. He had a record company called Tico. Tico. Mm -hmm. At the beginning. But he had a feel for rhythm and blues and black music. And he started a label called Gone and End, End Records. Yeah. Records. And the Chantels recorded on that. They were one of the first, one of the first big hits that they had was them. Right. And the first song they ever did was He's Gone. He's Gone. Before Maybe. Yeah. Then you came in. Well, Frankie Lyman came. Yeah, he came on the G and label. He was on, wait a minute, he had another label. What was that label? Rama. Was it? Was Rama. It, it was Rama remember? and G. Rama and G. G yeah. Right, okay. right. He had so many days. First on big hit he had was on Rama. It was called G by the Crows. Right. Do 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 do. Because of the success of that, he started another label. Took the song G and called the label G. G. Mm -hmm. So he had Rama with the runs, come back, my love. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Come back, my love. Beep, up, up. 
then Rama G, and then Rama Chantel's, Lung. and then you. But before that, mm. Richard Barrett and the Ballantines. Yes. Right. And then Richard became my became my producer and manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, you know, it's just amazing what happened in those days, man. Um, when you're a kid like that, you don't think of the you, you don't think tomorrow. Tomorrow, you're just a kid. You're just living right now. You want to do what you want to do. Want to do what you do. I'd have paid somebody to sing. That's how bad I wanted to do it. You know, and so when somebody gave me a couple of dollars, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a baseball player. My father wanted me to be a draftsman, or what, you know, um, and I looked at him like he was crazy. My math is horrible, man. <laughs> and um, so, but that's what he had a dream for. And then I ended up singing with the guys in the school. Uh -huh. And then you remember the days of the lunch rooms that yeah. everybody would gather there. And it could be a good thing and not so good thing. If you've been in school like I was in with a lot of gangs, they all went to the same school, so it was sort of a peaceful time. And that lunchroom, the teachers loved it because that's when guys would sing. Different groups would start singing in the lunchroom. And as long as you're entertaining some people, they don't get so mean. <laughs> so the, the teachers loved it. Man. They, they loved that. Yeah, you know, it's funny because there were 45-minute periods back then, if you remember. When mm. you went to school, 45-minute when the bell rang, you had to keep quiet. Yep. Because if not, you got detention. <laughs> they want to know. Ah, <laughs> uh, you got a lot, so did I. <laughs> so Richard Barrett, yep. who is singing with a group called the Valentines, yes. is responsible for the Chantels, Frankie Lyman, and little Anthony and the Imperials. Mm -hmm. Who picked the song, Tears on My Pillow? Oh, that's a good story. I didn't. <laughs> Right? I mean, I wanted to do R&B, Fast Domino, right. Little Richard. I don't have any tears in my pillow. I didn't want to do that. But you know, when you're, like, you're, you're very young, you don't think right. But George Golan, the last of the record men, had a brilliant, brilliant air. And uh, he, he actually, when we went in the studio, we were supposed to sing just two kinds of people in the world. The B-side. Yeah, B-side. And Ernest wrote that. Yep. And everybody loved it. And he wrote, and we thought that was the one. But George, in doing the session, he goes, yeah, it's, it's good, but I, you know what? I got a song. You know the song I gave you guys to, to learn? Nobody liked it, so we didn't learn it. <laughs> and he says, uh, I'm going to get a band a break. Everybody go have lunch. And when they come back within an hour, I want you guys to see if you can do something. With me, it was easy because I... I, since I can remember as a kid, I can remember every melody I hear within 10 minutes. It stays in my head. So what I did was I wrote down the words. So when you, you hear me singing Tears by Pillow, I wasn't doing it from memory. I was reading it. And, and, he, and he said to, he said to the, uh, us to go back here in the room. And, and like that, the guys were sort of panicking. Man, what are we going to do? We don't have any back. We didn't work on anything. And one of the guys, I don't know which one it is, so, hey, man, you know, you know this song sounds like that song hmm, that goes, ooh, 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 ooh. Well, that was Earth Angel. By the Penguins. If you listen to Earth Angel, it's exactly the same the opening, background opening we were doing. Opening 16 bars, yeah. Getting tears on my pillow. So, um, but instead of doing, oh, oh, oh we did, ooh. ooh. <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> but, you know, the funny thing is, this is something you didn't know. He was going to sing it. Yeah. George Gona said, no, I don't want you to sing it. <laughs> yeah. Listen, this is a true story. <laughs> Tell him. Yeah. He, um, I'm in the booth, you know. And <laughs> you know, I see his face. I always call him Mr. Gona until I leave this earth because he was Mr. Gona. You had so much respect for him. Boy, Mr. Gona. He knows everything. And um, he, he, he was in the booth, and he's looking at me about the third take. He says, uh, Anthony. Ah, do, who do you like to listen to? What are the artists you like to listen to? And I told him all these artists. And the moon glows the Spaniels. Even before that, Elvis, Gerald, because my dad was oh, in jazz. Right. And I loved Nat Cole. Everything. I got stuff at Nat Cole home. And I uh, loved the way. He says, you see how he phrases everything? Every word is distinct. And I'm from Brooklyn. My whole thing breaks up. It did, so I thought about it, and I, in my mind, I kind of imagined 
Nat Cole, what he would do. You know, Nat would say everything, every word, you know? So I went like this. You don't remember me. You see the syllables? Normally, you, go, you, don't, you don't remember, you know, you don't remember me, but I did the syllables. And I did that. And he also said to me, hey, when you do that, he said, you talk so high. You have such a high voice. Why don't you sing like that? I, I said, I wanted to sound like all the cool dudes, you know. Right. And um, he said, no, do that. And um, I think it was the fourth or fifth take. I said, you don't remember me, but I remember you. Tears on my pillow. Pain. And he looked through the, 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 the booth. Through the booth. Yeah. yeah, you know, the engineering room. And he looked, and you could see a smile come on him. He's going, he hits a, a day, a, what's his name, Galley. I was Ernest was here. Lou Galley, yeah. which was his partner. It, right. And he hits him like, and I knew I'm on to something here, you know? And when that was over, we nailed it. And, and so the rest was history. I didn't think much about it until it came out when I was in summer school. All right, all right, all right. As for singing during the bell, when the bell went you off, know, you kept yeah, on singing. The tension thing, you know. <laughs> so I didn't do too well in the regular, you know. And I wanted to get my diploma. And they told me you got to do these particular subjects in the summer. In Brooklyn, in July and June is brutal. Humidity, everything. No air conditioning in those days. That was a luxury. You got them in department stores. But you didn't have them in your house. They didn't have air conditioning either back in the day. <laughs> no. So I'm stuck in the school. You know, I'm going, oh, man. And I recorded the, the record about two weeks prior. And I'm in, and in those days, you guys remember, they had these little radios, transistor radios. And I'm sitting there. This isn't the, everybody's got a book, right? It's in my book. It's, it's That's in the somewhere. book. Anyway, I'm sitting there, and these little girls go, I'm going, I'm looking at them, wondering, well, they don't know me. I don't know them. But they knew. How they knew, to this day, I can't figure it out. Well, it was they, on radio. Well, they figured out I was the guy. <laughs> and so and the, and the, when I went outside, when the guy says, hey, man, they're playing your record everywhere. Uh, really? So I, <laughs> I got home, and it was true. When I turned on WINS yep, yep. and what was the other stations? I started W A D O Jocko. Jocko. And they're playing this thing like crazy. And I thought to myself, I don't need no stinking diploma. <laughs> I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> but the I name I didn't go to summer school. But it's crazy. <laughs> the name. Explain how you got the name. This is interesting, folks. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, theories about it. I heard Ernest, I mean I mean Clarence, you know, mm -hmm. retired. He was on, did an interview on somebody, HBO or something long ago. Mm -hmm. And I saw it, and I'm saying, oh, I heard it another way. He said it one way, and I heard it another. The way that I heard it was that we, we were talking about this earlier, the disc jockeys, and you knew one of them, had they played what they wanted to play. And they had that listening day. And so the promoter who was promoting the record, I remember, actually, I met the guy years ago. He's still, he's still with us. And he went in, and he played it. And boy, um, Alan, Alan, Freed. Alan Freed. And Alan Freed said, boy, that girl can sing. And, 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 the, and, the, and the promoter said, it's no girl, it's a guy. He says, he must be awfully little. True story. <laughs> because what had happened when they said it was Anthony, Alan Freed remembered that you were singing I with, with the, du the DuPonts. The, with the DuPonts. We opened this show for him one time. Right. And the song was You. 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 Hey, so when Alan found that, it was you, and he said, that little guy. Yeah, he said, he said that said little the guy. guy. <laughs> yeah. As he knew, uh, you know, when you talk about people that had an intimate relationship, one was him and I, Jerry. We, did, did we know each other 100 years. We know each other so much. And we did a lot of things together. Uh, well, Alan was that way. I said, do a lot of the shows. No one knew we were the opening act. Who cared when you had the platters, oh, Frank and Lyman, the teenagers, Little Nappy Richard, Brown, Little Richard. Chucky, Chuck Nobody Larry. cared about the opening act. But that's what we did. And, and so, but he liked us. Yes, he did. Really liked us. And I used to go to where, Alan liked us in the New York Paramount. 
in the Brooklyn Paramount too, he would always sit by the front door. Why? I don't know. He would sit by the front door on something like a stool, a real high I stool, watch. and just I, watch. I watch all the acts. Yeah. So I was coming in, Frankie Lyman was coming. That's when I first started befriending Frankie Lyman. And we became best of friends. He, he was, I was standing and he said, look at you guys. What a group. What a bunch. <laughs> and he, say, he says, Anthony, don't, don't go with this little kid. They were kidding around, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he would say that. And this fond sort of connection began with Alan and myself. And I got to say this. I don't want to talk too much. Which no, is no. Not. This is your platform. I Come on. You. Okay. They, do you love him? Yeah. Al Alan Free, when Payola came out, was well, that was the biggest ripoff. There's no such. I mean, it's payola was payola, payola's now. Nobody takes payola more than politicians, and they you know, <laughs> they turn around and try to, you know, they did they put they, they used him as the the, the 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 guy that got the fall guy. Well, you know, you know, if you, if Alan Free, ladies and gentlemen, was so big, he mm -hmm. really was the father was of guy. rock and roll. Uh, there were disc jockeys before Alan that played rhythm and blues. But when you are in New York City, and when you have the Paramount Theater where Frank Sinatra played, mm -hmm. and you have rock and roll at the Paramount Theater, and then the Brooklyn Paramount Theater, yep. who is this guy? Lines around the block. The corner. Lines around the block. Be. And Alan had some dear friends. Mm -hmm. As you know, Jack Hook. Jack Hook is a dear friend of mine. Tito Puente's cat. Right. But Tito was the manager. Manager Tito Puente. And, and back then, the entertainment business was controlled. The boys. By guys. <laughs> the know? boys, we call I them. I mean, I worked for them. Sinatra worked for them. Everybody you worked did. for them. We did it. And what happened is they had a DA. I believe it was Morgan Stern. Yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> He was looking into organized crime in the record business and looking into Alan Freed. Mm -hmm. They had nothing to do. These, yeah. We had nothing to do with that. But they were after him. And when Paola started, he was the fall guy. Fall guy. Yeah, he, yes. he really was. And, you know, he would not sign. A, if you saw, you should get the documentary Air, Airtime. Oh, yeah. I got one, too. Yeah, you, because of the fact it talks about the fact that they wanted him to sign an affidavit that he did not accept Paola. Well, he did. He said he did. He, he said, said I can't sign that. Yeah. So they fired him. And that's all in this documentary. And it was the end. But he truly was the man. And then came Dick Clark. Yes. Dick Clark took <coughs> our music. And I've always <coughs> given, in my book, I talk about... The fact that at the beginning, Dick Clark and I, I danced on bandstand. It was Bob Horn's you bandstand. Yeah, you was on there. I was right. before. I was getting $15 a week. Bob Horn got fired, and they brought Dick Clark in, and they wanted me to do the same thing. It's in the book. And I said, no, we want Bob Horn back. They said, we're going to give you $30. I said, I don't want the money. So we picketed. Now, imagine trying to do a dance show on bandstand with no dancers. Yeah. What happens? Cops arrest me, and <laughs> my first pinch at the age of 15... <laughs> The pickets go down, and the kids go in, and Dick Clark becomes the man. Mm -hmm. And everything that Bob Horn had, Dick Clark got. Oh, yes. There was nothing wrong with it. Publishing companies, pressing plants, management everything. companies. It was a big business. It was a business. So big. And because of their thinking that somebody's behind this, they created this whole situation. And they found no one was behind anything. They were just taking money. It was original uh, witch hunt. It was the original it, one. It the first. really was. I mean, it was bad. And I remember saying, well, what happened? We're having a great time, and all of a sudden somebody wants to come in and blow out of the water. It was so trivial. It was so stupid. Because even today, you want to talk about payola? It's called advertisement. <laughs> yeah. It's business. You, like, you had, you know, you guys, it's... Hey, the disc jockeys weren't making all the money in the radio station. They stations. never got paid. They made it from the record they hops. They made it from the record hops. And, and stuff. whatever, me, and I'm not that I'm any different than any guy, but I didn't want to take money. Because if I didn't like the record, yeah. back then the guys come in with a sleeve, $50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I like this record. <laughs> and it has a brand new record right now by Eddie Fatosi <laughs> and the And as soon as the, the promotion guy would leave, he throw the record throw away. He won't play it again. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what really happened. Yep. The record companies and the publishing companies started the beef that we're giving these guys money, 
<laughs> and they're not playing. We play when we're there. And then they had to forget Eddie for the touchy in the Middle East. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but forget That's all crazy. that. Let's talk about you. Me. Now, the years with Gone and End. Yes. Tears of My Pillow, Shimmy Shimmy, Coco Pop, Please Say You Want Me To Be, mm -hmm. all of that wonderful R&B. Now there's a brief period in your career where the hits are not coming in. Yeah. You meet a fella by the name of Don Costa. Yes, <laughs> great Don Costa. And Teddy Rendaza. Yes, he, Don Costa, for anybody out there, was Frank Sinatra's producer for many, many years. All those great records with Don Costa. And was responsible for a kid called Paul Anka. Paul Anka. That's on right. ABC. You, me you remember Paul? <laughs> yeah. I thought he was a nightingale. Well, you know, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, when he was a kid, we all toured together on Dick Yeah, we, on tours. the shows. So we all knew each other. I mean, like, it was, like, really intimately. You had to be on a bus with, like, three seats or two seats, you know, on each side. And so you get to know everybody. We had to yeah. all go to the same yeah. places and do the same thing. So he was really cool. We had a relationship a long time. And then he went off. Well. Took he, another, another level. He went because of. Because Bobby Darren. Oh, right. Exactly. So. Teddy Rendaza, Don Costa, first song on DCP Records. Mm -hmm. Tell them what it was. Well, the, I would, we would, I had, I left the group because I was told I was going to be an actor, which I believed. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, you always have people coming. Oh, you don't need those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I went off, and I was innocent. I just wanted to do better, and I love because before I even sang, I did do theater as a right. child actor. My mother was one of those people who had me and all those kind of things. So I wanted to really do that again, and they told me and whatever, and it didn't work out. And then I left the group. And while I was gone from the group, a man by the name of Kenny Seymour came into the group who bought some new stuff. I don't know if you, it, it was called Fort Bart Modern Harmony, which were jazz notes, but they were beautiful. He actually incorporated those notes into rock and roll and pop. This kid out of Brooklyn, black kid's name is Kenny Seymour. His son today is one of the top arrangers and producers on Broadway. Yep. So he was that talented. And, and so we, we, he started, when we got back together, he was doing all this stuff. And then Ernie Martinelli came into our lives. Became your manager. Yeah, Johnny and Ernie. <laughs> what a team those guys was. His brother. It was, and but the, mostly they were the, the comedians. They had all the great comedians in that agency. And we really were the only act to sing it. And he said one day, he said, hey, you know, guys, I saw this guy. You know, you know, it's Teddy Rondazzo? I said, yeah. I met Teddy, Teddy when I was with the DuPonts. Yeah. And when, when I was with the DuPonts, he said, we're going to do something someday. The Chuckles. The Chuckles. He was, Teddy Rondazzo was with a group called The Chuckles, had a big song as a solo artist called The Way of a Clown. Yep. On ABC Paramount. He wrote it. Uh, yeah, he wrote that. And he started the right material and hooked up with Costa. And they gave this young man mm -hmm. the greatest material, which changed his whole career from just the street corner kids singing the on the corner. The doo and all that stuff. No, we went another direction. They wore tuxedos? Yes, and that was the classic thing that, 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 that Richard Barrett really wanted us to do. Right. But Don Costa, who I love him very much, this, I just miss him. He told me one day, he said, hey, kid. He says, one of these days, I'm going to teach you something. You know, I know you kind of sing, but I want to teach you how to sing. So he would load me up with Sinatra stuff, yeah. load me up with everybody. And I'd listen to stuff over and over and over again. And it began to change my phrasing, my attitude, and everything. So when they gave us the songs, like Outside Looking In, Take Me Back, Hurt So Bad, Going Out of My Head, that wasn't doo-wop. That was a whole new world. We, we just went to another They level. didn't even hear the wonderful things, the wonder oh, of you. The wonder of you. Oh. oh, what was that? Oh, man, he wrote, they did some stuff. We, I was listening the other day. It was brilliant. It, it, did, it wasn't commercially received, you know. You know, you and I know this. A writer writes from the experiences mm -hmm. that he has. Yep. Teddy Rendaza was going through a terrible, terrible. divorce. <laughs> terrible divorce. Every song, I'm on the outside looking in, was about him. Mm -hmm. okay. Hurt so bad. Was going out of my head. Going out of my... See, they, these are the great writers. Teddy Rendaza, in my opinion, was one of the greatest one of the One of the greatest writers. And created a new career. Even Sinatra did going out of my head. Yes, he did. Right? Yes, he did. So, so see, that's the passion of writing, singing, and music. 
You do it from where you live. Mm -hmm. He sings from where he lives. Yeah. Anchor writes from where he lives. He lives, yeah. You know, and... All of us have that thing. And then uh, what, what it was was that we knew something was going to happen that was entirely different. And I got to tell this story. He was, Teddy was in... We had do, did well, on the outside looking in. And it was a huge hit. And... Um, um, he, he, he was in Europe or something. I don't remember what it was. We get, I got a call because of the time difference. It was like 4 a.m. in the morning. And he says, yes, yeah, me, Teddy. Get everybody together. I'm flying in. I'll be in the morning. You gain time when you, when you go west. I'll be in the morning, and I want anybody off to by 10. I couldn't find anybody. Everybody was out <laughs> there partying and doing what they do. And, and I couldn't find anybody. And um, finally, we, we did hook up with some of the cats, and we went to the we went back to the office. He says, I, "I'm going to play. I got to play this song for you." We said, "This is what we come into the office at ten o'clock in the morning for." Yeah, I got this. Is I just you got to hear this. He had this little upright piano mm -hmm. that laid against the wall in that little rehearsal room mm -hmm. at the DCP yeah. Don Costa production, and all of a sudden Don comes in with his brother. And he says, yeah, yeah, listen to this. Listen to this song. And he's, he's hitting this piano going, boom, 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 boom. Well, I think Go I'm going to out of my head. So all the guys are sitting there going, dang, you never heard anything like that before. <laughs> but we knew, wait a minute, this is something a little bit different here. Yeah. You know, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a young man that has had a career from the DuPonts to the Chesters to Little Anthony and the Imperials. He has covered every genre, rhythm and blues, class. Mm -hmm. This is the real secret of our music. Little Anthony, ladies and gentlemen, if you would.